Okay, so hello and good afternoon. My name is Erin Wagoner, Foundation Specialist with Corporate Member Services for Chime. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar, Collaborative Partnerships, Improving Patient Access Without Staff Overload. Before we get started with the presentation, I'm gonna cover a few technical details. The Q&A area is located on your screen option bar. This will allow you to ask questions during today's presentation. To ask a question, type your message inside the Q&A chat box and press press the send key. I will ask the question on your behalf and the speakers will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. If you're having difficulty listening to the live audio stream through computer speakers, teleconferencing is available. To display the teleconference instructions, click on the communicate menu to view your audio options. By attending today's session, you may earn up to one continuing education credit. Please be sure to visit the Chime website for more details. We also ask that you please take a few moments to complete the evaluation that will automatically pop up in your web browser at the end of the session. Your feedback is valuable for all of our future programming. And a quick reminder, all registrants for this event will receive a link to the session recording following the webinar. Now with that, um, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today's session. With us today is Michelle Winfield Hanneran. Chief Clinical Access Officer and Assistant Vice Chancellor for Access at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, and Aditya Bansoon, Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder with Luma Health. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to turn things over to you. Thanks so much. Appreciate the introduction, Aaron. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone here at uh, Chime. Um, we had a great Chime event a couple weeks ago at Vive, so we were just really happy to keep this the good times rolling for all things Chime related. Um, I'm going to kind of be the MC, and the way we wanted to do this was a little more of a podcast format uh, to to take a couple words out of Michelle's mouth. So we'll have some slides, cover some stuff, but let's get started with a little bit about who we are. So Michelle, why don't you go ahead? You're our featured uh, featured star today. So why don't we go ahead and let everyone know a little more about you? Great, thank you. Thanks, Aditya, and thanks, Aaron, for the introduction. Um, as she said, my name is Michelle Winfield Hanrahan. I'm the Chief Clinical Access Officer uh, here at UAMS, as well as the Senior Nursing Director of the Cancer Institute, a new title I was just uh, bestowed in um, September. I'm a nurse by trade. My background is primarily in emergency medicine, critical care. Um, I worked the majority of my career at the Cleveland Clinic uh, for almost 18 years and then um, started my access journey with patient access in um, 2012 when I was headhunted to start up a joint venture patient access um, consultancy company and uh, did that for about 10 years, was recruited to work at Wellstar as their assistant vice president of access and then was recruited here to UAMS, where I now have the pleasure of partnering with uh, the Luma Health Team. And that's how Aditya and I met. That's right. And uh, for everyone's benefit, my name is Aditya. I'm one of the founders and CTO here at Luma Health. Uh, my journey is nowhere near as, as illustrious and nowhere near as long <laughs> as Michelle's. Um, but you know, we founded Luma Health in 2015 on the simple purpose of needing care is hard, being able to get access to care shouldn't be. And kind of along that access and along that dimension, we found great partnership with uh, Michelle and the team at UAMS, specifically around you know patients want care and getting it's hard. And solving that uh, in, in, in forever long conundrum in healthcare is sort of a joint vision that I think a lot of us here in healthcare share. And so today we're going to talk about how do we do that without necessarily having to just light up staff members and bring a ton of additional horsepower to bear using automation technology to, to get us there. So really the kind of the, the framework for today's discussion that uh, Michelle and I are gonna have, and hopefully you all get a benefit from, is really around kind of four key key areas. Number one is kind of like, just kind of landscape and, and challenges, you know, things that we've been hearing, things that like, you know, Michelle like lives and in, intimately lives <laughs> every day. Um, the, the challenge of uh, making access better, kind of this core raison d'etre, if you will, um, pardon my French in a good way, um, to uh, make patients access, patient access better. Talk about things that UAMS is UAMS. Michelle, I always want to say UAMS. You always say UAMS, and I always <laughs> put it in my mouth. Okay. I know, I do it every talk. time. <laughs> and then uh, we'll talk about just kind of recommendations and things from there. So really what our hope, you know, uh, with the CM credits that you, you're aiming to achieve out of this is just how to make sure uh, we help with automation and technology using the expertise that Michelle has to kind of balance, uh, you know, what patients need without having to, you know, like I said, just hire a bunch of staff, 
uh, use technology to get us there. And then, you know, helping you understand, you know, vendor selection, how to, you know, find partners to get that going. So, but why don't we start with a little bit about you, AMS, not UMS, uh, <laughs> you know, a little bit more about you. You know, I had the pleasure to call on site a couple of weeks ago, see this firsthand, but uh, I think for the benefit of everyone, love to learn a little bit more about, you know, your service mission, what you guys deliver in the Arkansas communities. Sure. So um, we're the only level one trauma center in the state of Arkansas. We are the largest public employer um, with about roughly 10,000 employees um, in 73 of the 75 uh, counties. And um, our clinical affiliates are we we provide a lot of economy to the um, order, you know, to Arkansas in general. Arkansas, um, I'm not native to here. I'm a transplant um, back in 2021. So there are lots of rural communities out in Arkansas where we have footprints in the form of primary care clinics, but our mission is truly to be able to provide healthcare, both you know in the larger city of Little Rock as well as out into the rural communities and train future surgeons, doctors um, to continue the care here in the state. And um, Michelle, you when you came, I think one of the things that's really interesting for me is you made a joke about this. You've like added titles and titles. I think your email footer is about <laughs> as, twice as long as most emails I've ever received. Um, and I think part of that is like a, a, a transformational set of changes that are happening at UAMS, right? <laughs> How to make access better, putting great leaders in front of it. Can you talk a little bit about that change that's happened, like how UAMS is kind of UAMS is evolving uh, around making access a priority? Sure. You know, I think um, a lot of academic medical centers live on the fact that they are the, you know, they're, they're an academic medical center. And of course, everybody is going to want to come to them because they are an academic medical center. There's trials, there's experiments, you know, there's, there's far more opportunities for um, subspecialized care than there may be at your local community hospital. And I think one of the challenges when I, when I got here was, is that we had a large patient influx but really trying to figure out, you know, like what can be seen by the subspecialist, what needs to be seen by the primary care doctor, and how do we how do we manage that? And then that, like, just from an outpatient ambulatory access side, um, there's far more in relation to patient access. You've got inpatient flow, you've got, you know, the ED, you've got a variety of different ways that you know patients can get into your system. And what we, what I found when I got here was, is we had an extremely high no-show rate. We had oodles of patients in the ED for very minor issues. And it's because we did not have good access to provide to patients. That's like, you know, I, I think that sets the stage very like, you know, a lot for kind of one of the, you know, reasons that Luma Health exists. And so, you know, our, 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 fundamental uh, reason we founded the company, that's a younger, less gray hair version of me uh, in that <laughs> photo there and my, my two co-founders. Um, one of the reasons we founded the company is that, you know, needing healthcare is hard, being able to get care shouldn't be. And I think that's one of those fundamental challenges you often find where getting access to care becomes challenging. The care, the demand is gonna, is gonna go where the supply exists, right? And it's kind of incumbent on us as leaders to kind of make avenues into that supply, you know, the care supply, uh, simpler, easier, and more accessible. And you know, I, I think that's that's really a lot about some of these challenges that uh, we hear talking to you know chime members and talking to you know folks in the community at large. Which is these are the things I think that prevent us from being able to get to those care opportunities. So I know some of these things are things are, are challenges you live every day. I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of you know what you're thinking about kind of problems that you see like in the wild around margin around your staff. You know, I think there's a lot of insight that you have here that's really helpful for people to hear. Sure. So, I mean, if I was a CFO, I would start with the margin pressure, right? Because that's where, where everybody goes. Um, but in, for me, you know, we really need to think about the patient experience. Mm -hmm. And they're looking to us to seek care. And if it's a bad experience out of the gate, they can't get an appointment when they want to. They, they can't get to the right specialist. There's multiple reasons why they get rescheduled. The, the, you know, EHR records don't map. There's not care everywhere. It just makes for a really poor patient experience and, and they don't yeah. want to come back. And, and for me, you know, we want to be able to provide the care that the patient needs. Um, staff utilization goes into the margin pressure, right? Everybody's being asked to do more with less. How do we, how do we do this without human capital? How do we work through things? And um, I will tell you, we just lived through an exercise with Huron as a consultancy um, company to look at some of our um, practices. And, you know, 
we're down like every other health system across the country with staff and they're burnt out and they're tired and it goes all the way from the bedside nurse all the way down to the visitor registration check-in person and scheduling teams. So it's it's a lot. And then understanding that our budgets aren't where they were five, 10, 15 years ago. It's, it's this combined is like the perfect storm. Yeah. And I, I had the opportunity uh, at, at what I was mentioning briefly at Hims, uh, sorry, at Vive last week, Hims is next week, at Vive mm-hmm. last week to uh, host a focus group. And one of the things we talked about was this, and, and there's a quote here that uh, was really, really interesting, I think, in the focus group, which is the only flexibility is in the costs, right? Like there is not, you know, without a huge amount of work, you're not just on the magically kind of materialized demand, right? And so that makes, you know, what you're saying, 10 years ago, the budget, there might have been a thicker margin to be able to experiment with to grow, but they're just that, that squeeze makes it difficult to innovate. And I think that echoes a lot with what you were saying earlier. And another question we'd ask, and I'd be curious to get your take on this, Michelle, too, is we, we asked, um, as like an access leader, if you had a magic wand to turn any system, you, you know, whether you're actually in the uh, the red, but if, you know, hypothetically from the red to the black, what were, what would that magic wand be? Like, what would you say? It's like, ah, this is a thing I can do to make things better. Yeah, and it'll say semicolon, take politics and institutional stuff out of the mix. Right. It's the it's the it's the million dollar question, right? Everybody is being asked to generate revenue um, in ways that we hadn't done it before, in different ways, in new ways. Um, and it's how do we get more patients in the door as quick as we can get them in? There? Um, and, and that's that is the magic wand um, that I think is is good. Um and it's it's the one that we that we are striving for. And you know, before as an academic, uh, you know, medical center, everybody was so subspecialized. That, you know, is so subspecialized today that the specialists kind of only want to see the things that they specialize in. And and I always use neurology as as a as an example. You know, a a, a neurologist can can specialize in a hundred different things, but at the end of the day, they're board certified in neurology. So when you have an extremely subspecialized neurology clinic and nobody wants to see headache, you, you don't have anybody to see those patients that need headaches, which is one of the number one referrals into a neurology department. So I say all of that to say that we are in a scenario now where our sub-subspecialists are actually seeing general, general neuro things because we need to get the patients in the door and we don't have the luxury of picking and choosing anymore who our patients are. I think one of the challenges there is actually changing hearts and minds to like, you know, at the service line level and curious, like, how do you impact that change? Because I can't imagine that's just like, and now your job is and academic medicine, like that necessary, I'm almost certain that won't fly. Yeah. So um, it starts with really strong chairs, but it's mm-hmm. just, a, it's an overarching understanding of the current financial situation that we're in today. And also, um, you know, I, I, you don't want to lose the market share of the, of the patients that you do have, and you don't want to lose your refer, your referral patterns. So if, you know, Dr. X refers you the subspecialized movement disorder, but then, you know, and you accept it, but then, you know, you deny or don't accept 10 referrals for headache, that, sub, that physician's not going to send you that patient anymore. So um, we've kind of flipped the script and said, not only do we need to do this for fiscal responsibility, but we also need to do this to keep the referral patterns alive. Interesting. So that that's that's actually really powerful, and I think one of those that's a, like a really strong thought around, um, you know, getting buy-in on the, actually the problem definition across Absolutely. the organization is actually important because you know you said it's, it's strong chairs on one hand, right, at the service line level, but it's also like having them understand what like the actual like the the business, if you will, is considering in order for you know to have a con- conversation on solvency and all that good stuff. Right. And then one one of the other things I kind of want to like think about a little bit is like, you know, how, what the staff is that's used to power these activities. And, you know, the referral pattern is such a good one because, you know, you can imagine, and you probably actually have numbers and thoughts on this, like how many individual human beings from like referring physician to moment of care, does that thing have to go touch? And it's probably a dozen plus, I don't know. What, what, what do you think? Well, I mean, when you think about, I mean, you can even start at the outside physician level, right? Patient walks into the clinic, that provider, you know, creates a referral, either calls the office, you know, also calls the clinic here at UMS or sends a referral. Referral comes into the HIM team, they create the shell, that gets sent on to the next part, which is a scheduler who looks at the referral, then, you know, needs to determine, do they need medical records? Who do they need to schedule with? Then that, you know, that could be an email or two back to the clinic to figure that out. 
So it, it's a significant amount of um, people that it touches. And, and when you're the patient on the other hand, you know, hand being told you need to see a neurologist and you're waiting and waiting and waiting, it can get extremely frustrating. Yeah. It, so I was trying to like do the mental map as you were going through that, like HIM, shell record, schedule, <laughs> email, referral. Like, I think I at least counted like six or seven people in that mix from like the moment, like maybe, you know, mm -hmm. you know a direct message is sent saying like, get this patient in. And I, I mean, I think that's sort of what we're trying to, you know, solve for with technology, to be honest, is, um, you know, we want our people to work on the highest level activities, right? Like the real value adding activities, and some of these like, you know, very mundane rote tasks become challenging, right? To be able to scale. And it's that quote from uh, that member of the focus group I thought was really, really powerful in that, which is like, you know, we're only going to squeeze at that piece, right? Like the patient volumes are kind of there. We've got to capture them. We've got to squeeze on the margin side. So like, I think that's just, it helps articulate that point. So let's, um, let's talk a little bit about like the challenge of the patient access, like kind of go to that chapter of the story. Sure. I, I, and, you know, one of the things we've heard a lot about, you know, from what you've been saying now, Michelle, but also cats like Chime members broadly is, um, you know, how to bring in more patients, because you were just saying like, you know, you have the referral pattern, you can't mess that up because like, that's critical, but you also have, like the patients off the street, right? Like there's new entrance to the state, there's new services you may provide. So like, do you find that like top level, like, you know, using marketing terminology, like top of funnel is an important part of your access story? It, it is. It's it's really important. And when you think about just, you know, the steps that it takes from a patient, you know, in an outside facility to get get into a subspecialist at UMS, it, it's it's all the things. Right. It's it's how do you navigate the system? How do we how do we get them in here as quick as possible, but also make sure that they have everything that the provider needs in order to provide a, a very well-rounded visit that can help them get what they need and make sure that their diagnosis is taken care of. So, um, you know, always being asked to bring in more patients, it's it's a double-edged sword. And this is what I, I've been on my soapbox about for months now, because when everybody starts screaming about, you know, we need to market, we need to get more patients in here, we need to, you know, make more access. If we don't have slots to put these patients in that we're directly marketing to, we have completely destroyed everything that we're doing and they're never going to call again. I was doing some consultancy work on a hospital up north and there was a specific uh, scenario where a cohort of um, patients in, in the surrounding area was going to lose their, um, the organization no longer, the one organization no longer took their healthcare insurance. So this organization I was consulting in, um, this is prior to get in there, they wanted to capitalize on this and they started marketing this 1-800 number, get these people in the door, we can take care of you, we'll take your, you know, we take your insurance. The biggest mistake they made is they didn't have enough people to answer the phone. So they oh had boy. like a 62% abandonment rate and captured like little to no market share because no, there wasn't enough people to answer the phone. They didn't realize how much that volume was going to be. So... so I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, this is super interesting because like what you're, the way you're describing this, like, and I've talked to a lot of leaders and it's often like, you know, it's a siloed thing. Like marketing goes, mm -hmm. does this, access mm -hmm. does this, call center does this. And like, if you're just very lucky and all the stars align, like this, the bow constrictor is not like choking itself as like, you know, the volume right. moves through the system. But you're talking about like, actually there's a need for somebody to think like syst with systems level thinking. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious, like, or I'd love to learn more because- you know, people are used to say to yourself, people are banging down your door saying, we should be doing more marketing. Like when you think about that tops down system level thinking, where do you see like the gaps and challenges to make sure the snake isn't trying to swallow the, you know, proverbial volume? Right. I think it's really important to add in and, and make sure that all the right players are at the table. Right. And this is something that we, we had to learn here at UIMS because my role didn't exist before I came. Mm -hmm. So no one really, I, I think initially when I got here, nobody knew what to do with me. Now I'm very popular. <laughs> because that's like Wait, this is maybe a quick like sidebar on this. How was it run before you came? Because you pulled a lot of stuff together, right? Like you became a focal point of a lot sure. of what said. So what was old and what was new? So historically, um, we had a couple of physician champions, I think that were kind of working in access trying to do their regular day job of seeing patients and then champion this access piece on the side. Um, and, and they did, they did a good job. I mean, they put some standards in place. They worked on a lot of the pieces parts to kind of get it where it was, but 
nobody um, was, you know, singing off the same hymn sheet as the Irish say. There was no dedicated metric that everybody was trying to achieve. The metric that they were working off of when I got here was third next available, which isn't really the greatest metric for access. You know, you really want to look at new patient lag, you know, and, and make sure you get where you want your goal to be. Typically seven days for primary care, 14 days um, for, for specialty. And every kind of service line or clinic was kind of doing their own thing. So one of the things I wanted to get right into when I got here was like meeting with each of the service lines. So it's, it's the provider, it's the service line administrator, it's your front end staff, it's your scheduler, it's the nurses to kind of figure out like how, how are you doing access? And we learned it was very varied and it was all over the place. And in one meeting, they're talking about third next available and one meeting they're talking about something different. And I was like, oh no, we have to, we have to get this all together. Like we have to start all looking and marching towards the same thing. Um, and then, you know, there was no, <laughs> we're a very data rich organization, but we're very poor at our data utilization. There yeah. really wasn't any access dashboards. There was nothing that was like, you know, point of a click to be able to get information out to say like, this is your physician utilization. This is where your new patient lag is. So I kind of took all that and put it together. So now when we start to talk about you know, a new service, something we're going to provide differently. Everyone knows involve the access team because at the end of the day, it's my team that's going to be answering the phone or taking these patient phone calls that are coming in. We have to be involved early on. That's a really big mentality shift, but like both in deciding to hire you into this role to kind of centralize all this sort of stuff, but also to like, because ultimately I think what it leads to is kind of what is on this next, which is like getting patients what they need at the right mm -hmm. time and place. Right. And, um, you know, there, there. It's funny, like we Luna, like our leadership team, we had like a management meeting like yesterday or on <laughs> Monday, and one of the things that we were talking a lot about is uh, that that one that's a management consulting line, which is you, you measure, manage what you measure, right? Mm -hmm. And like third next day versus new patient lag. You know, if you look at people who talk a lot of like quadruple aim, you like you know that like third next day is like kind of like the goldish standard for one of the high wedges in quadruple aim. Why don't you like it? You know, I I go, um, we follow a lot of Elizabeth Woodcock's access um, yep. um, methodology, if you will. And the third next available metric needs to be looked at with a variety of other things. It's not the way to look at it to be able to say, I mean, yes, I can say like the third next available to see this patient is blah, but it's usually pretty much a manual pull. It's someone, you know, ticking boxes, or at least that's how it was here. Um, and we just said like, we're going to blow, I mean, I came in and just said, we're going to blow up access. Like we're not like, we're just going to blow it up and put it back together and, and make it simple, easy. You know, I don't, ex nobody can, not everybody can be an access expert, right? So like service line administrators have 700 other things that they have to work yes, on, on top of access. So if I can make this easy for them and say, I can print you a report or you can go into Power BI and print your own report to show your seven day, 14 day lag, your physician utilization, and that's perfect. And we can have a conversation about it. We can look at ways to improve access. We can look at ways to help no-show rates, but like some of that has to be owned by them as well. Because one of the things, you know, I'm at a, at a loss for is I don't know every single in and out of how they run their clinic. Um, yeah, sure. And that's the piece that I need them to fill in to help me determine what's the best way to fix their access challenges. It, it's sort of that... Um... There's subject matter experts, but there's also subject matter experts, right? Like both sides have to be uh, tightly linked together. And I, I think especially with the challenge of like, you know, having, um, you know, limited staff budget, like you know, the service line leaders can't just go hire a bunch of folks to go do it. You can't go hire a bunch of call center reps to go do it. Um, talk to me a little bit about like, you know, one of the things you said there was like, I will make, we're data rich, but you didn't say it quite this, but mm -hmm. I think we're data rich, but insights poor, data consumption right. poor. So one of those things I think I found a lot in talking to healthcare leaders is we put, you know, everyone's well intentioned. It just, you know, are they all reading the same signals? Are they reading the same data? But short of that, they may say, I need six more people to go do this. So when you kind of introduce new tooling, new the new Power BI dashboards with patient lags, like did that help on kind of alleviating some of the, or did it point the light in a different place? I, I think it, it helped, um, but, you know, immediately when they, they saw that lag was, you know, 14 days out or, 14 days would have been a godsend, 60 days, 80 days, 90 days. Then it was like, oh my God, we don't have enough people to answer the phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was, we didn't have enough provider slots. Um, we may not have had enough providers. 
um, you know, then it was, oh, we can get these people in faster. You're not turning the refer, you're not doing the referral work quick enough. Well, that's not the case. It was, it was just, it was a conglomeration of everything that people really never had looked at it in the way that we were embarking on this journey together. And I've done a lot of explaining. I'm explaining to a lot of physicians around, um, you know, this is what a lot of this means because physicians, when they go to med school, they're not taught about patient access. They're not taught about like how a referral gets in. They just know someone refers a patient to them and they want to see them in their clinic. And it's my job to make that as seamless as possible, not only for my provider, but for the referring pro provider and then for the teams that are doing the work. So, you know, initially it was, oh my God, we need all these people. And when I got here, we weren't really optimizing any type of technology in a way that it could be um, helpful to anyone. We weren't utilizing any kind of economies of scale. There were pockets of people and sitting in rooms all over the place that were taking phone calls. But you know, if you've got one not super busy practice and then you've got another practice that's getting crushed, because it was siloed, there was no way to, to roll the volume. There was no way to have any kind of backup support. So we worked towards centralizing a lot of that. But one of my biggest focuses was, you know, we need to get some type of technology in here and offload some of this like really rote work. And when you start to talk about, you know, technology, I've heard this more times than I can count, but I always hear the, I can go on my app and I can get a table on open table tomorrow. And that's what we want patient access to look like. And it's a long conversation to say that there are some instances where we can do that very easily, but there are other instances when a patient does need to talk to somebody and, you know, I always say healthcare is not booking an airline ticket and healthcare is not I, getting an open table reservation. <laughs> I, I love this example and I love you're you're kind of uh, laying out the laying out the roadmap perfectly for kind of going to this next section. I want to talk about like what are the, you know, found a whole bunch of stuff, did a bunch of structural improvements, but then you also applied a whole bunch of technology solutions into the mix. And I love that example because we all hear it all the time. Like, why isn't it, why can't I book an airline, like an appointment, like an airline ticket? And the reason I always give is how many airlines are there in the United States? There's like four, right? How many unique healthcare entities are in Little Rock? 300 probably, like let alone physicians, right? Like there's probably like 300, like, you know, NPI facilities in Little Rock itself or whatever it is. So I, I always find that example, like it's challenging to hear because like, of course, as a consumer, I want it that easy myself, but as like right. a practitioner in the healthcare IT space, I know they're not the same, but Let's talk a little bit because you've done a lot of work to use technology to provide, to build those experiences for your patients. So one, one of the ones I want to talk about is rescheduling. So I think there's a lot of work, you know, there's things that require a phone, but you've done a lot of work on making certain things very, very simple for your patients. So let's maybe start with kind of work you've done around hitting rescheduling technology used, how you made that better for uh, patients without having to ratchet up staff members to go do it. Yeah, so I mean, rescheduling is is always something that no matter where you are, whether you're in a clinic, whether you're in a centralized call center, no matter what it is, patients are going to reschedule, right? It happens, or we're going to reschedule the patient, which is even worse. Um, for for me, we we were tying up all this resource in patients that were calling to reschedule, and one of the other things that we had was a really high no show same day cancel rate. And I was racking my brain because what would happen is, is I would hear, you know, our physicians are scheduled utilization is, a, is 120%, but their actual, you know, physician utilization was 50. And you're chopping that up to like same day cancels and no shows. So in my mind, that was one of the things that we really had to tackle. And I wanted to, you know, no shows you can, you can kind of overcompensate or you can compensate with, with overbooking. Which again, yeah, it's like, that's like, like a, that's playing with live ammo, right? That's yeah, fire. I was going to say it's, it's a very dirty word. Um, if people don't know what you mean. Um, and then, you know, I was like, how do we help the same day cancellation? Well, we all know that, you know, there's a wait list functionality probably in every EMR, EMR that's out there, but we use Epic and that's what I'm most familiar with. But that wait list just sits there for somebody called in the clinic that never, you know, they never get called. And odds are, if you called me today and said, hey, Michelle, can you be, at, we have cancellation, can you be at this appointment at three o'clock? I'm not going to be there. And half of us on this call wouldn't be able to be there because our days are planned out. So we started to really think about ways that how could we fix this, you know, same day, no show, late cancellation piece. And um, Luma was one of the options. 
we had the reschedule functionality and I said, we're going to turn it on. And we started with ENT and we have rolled it out to the rest of our um, service lines in the organization. But one of the things that we did and, I, you know, I, ENT was really challenged with provider access. We didn't have enough providers. And I really wanted patients to understand that if you cancel this appointment, you're not going to get another one for probably 60 or 80 days, which I'm embarrassed to say that as the access officer, but we were really hamstrung by providers. So we actually put in the message, like, are you sure you want to cancel? Our next available is, and it would say like October, whatever. And we found a ton of individuals that didn't cancel their appointments and they actually showed up. So we decreased the no-show rate. It was upwards of probably like 22% in ENT. We dropped it down to five, which is in my opinion, best practice. And then a lot of those same day cancels, we were not technically able to backfill as easily, but they were reduced dramatically because we were giving people the opportunity to reschedule. If they right. need so let's talk, I mean, talk a little bit about, um, you know, you went and so for everyone else's benefit on the webinar, like this is a capability that we partner with UAMS to provide from Luma's uh, patient, what we call our patient success platform. But, you know, you went and looked and tried to, you know, you wanted to build a capability and offering and you went to go, you know, find a vendor and a partner who helps you do that. So can you talk a little bit, and, you know, and, and someone that worked well with Epic, right? Epic is the system of record. We want to make sure that Epic is at the center point of your health IT ecosystem. And also in that same consideration, I know uh, we've talked about this, like without creating more work, right? Like you want it to feel native to Epic. You want it to smell native to Epic. You want it to have that, that umami you get, if you will, um, when you're inside Epic. So tell me a little bit more about like, you know, how did you think about vendor selection, system design, solution design, that sort of thing? Yeah, so I say this in the Detinos, I say this all the time, you know, I must have sat on five or six or seven different vendor calls about texting and there, there's no magic to texting, right? Like three-year-olds do it. So it wasn't, it, to me, it wasn't like, you know, how are we going to, what's the text going to look like and what's the font going to be? For us, I knew we were starting to embark on this journey of needing to partner with a technology vendor exactly to Aditya's point, that would supplement our EHR, not replace it, because all of us that are in Epic shops know that it costs an, an extraordinary amount of money. And um, when you go to the CIO or the CMIO and say, well, I want to add this bolt-on, they're like, no, you know, we're going to do this through Epic. So um, my biggest focus when we, when we met with a lot of these vendors was, I need somebody who is going to be a willing partner for us, be able to show me things or give me information on things that I didn't even dream of or think existed, and then partner with me and how do we make that happen for UMS, as well as, you know, what can we do from a customization perspective um, in regards to what we do here that's unique that not every other health system does. And we just collectively kind of came to Luma as our partner because they had all of the things that we were looking for. And, you know, I meet with them regularly. They come on site. We talk about our challenges. I ask them a hundred times, what exactly did we buy? Are we using it? Are we using it in the right way? How do we use it? My latest ask was, um, because we're in the path of totality for the eclipse, you know, where I'm being asked, can we pull the patients and find out if they're going to come to their appointment on this date? And I frantically texted Aditya and said, hey, can we do this? I need like bi-directional texting to be able to say, you know, are you going to come to your appointment? Or are you not going to come to your appointment? And just kicked right in. We got it moving. And, you know, we're getting the information back that we need to help us determine how we're going to support the business and the volume those days. So um, they've just been a really great partner for us. And, and we've done a lot of cool things um, together in you know, you put me and Adnan in a room together, we create all these crazy ideas and, and, it, and it works out really well for us. I, that was very flattering. I'll start with that. I, <laughs> I, that was not, that, you, you get, I gave you an inch, you took a mile and I love that. But I think more, <laughs> what it's interesting to me though, and I think one of the things that we love for when we're working with partners such as, uh, you know, you and your team is really trying to think about like the art of the possible, right? Mm -hmm. And and for, for folks who um, might've missed that part, they're like, Arkansas isn't that, you know, the eclipse that's happened, the total eclipse, the next one's not happening for 35, 45 years, whatever it is. Um, one of the things we've tried to figure out was, are those patients going to arrive 
right? Because, you know, the state might be overrun, like, you know, with, with visitors and that sort of stuff. And um, I don't know if you caught this, Michelle, but like uh, Delta Airlines or United, someone is offering an airplane flight that tracks the eclipse, which I was like, well, what a cool like product offering, um, like very tangential aside there. And, um, but I think one of the things that was really important when we thought about how to like co-design a solution was exactly that customization piece. And the thing that really strikes me, you used ENT as that first example, right? Because I think one of the things that's important, especially when we were talking about the earlier part of our dialogue around access being specific to not just your geography, not just your patient demographics, but also the service line. And I think one of the things that becomes really important without having to layer more staff work on it is being able to tune and customize and deliver specific experiences at the service line level oftentimes. And so, you know, that part where you're like, hey, if you reschedule this via text, you may not be able to be seen until October. Did you decide that that was worth keeping in all the service lines or is that like an ENT because they were kind of the most impacted with the lack of physicians or providers? We kept it in the service lines where we knew we had some lag time just based on provider um, provider deficiencies, not, not enough. Um, and, you know, we didn't want to put it in primary care because the primary care historically, you know, sometimes we struggle with access in that space, not to the level of that many days, but it was just one of those, like, we really want you to think twice about canceling this appointment. And, you know, one of the, one of the challenges for us, because the lag was out so long, a lot of these people, you know, get their referral or they get told to see, you know, a, a, an allergy doctor and they call us and we tell them it's going to be 30, 60, 90 days and they still schedule the appointment, but they've already been somewhere else. And then when the, when they get the reminder of, oh, hey, you have an appointment, they just, you know, forgot about it. Blew, you know, we weren't telling anybody like you have an appointment on Thursday. So we had a ton of notions because of that. So we really utilized the rescheduling to help drive that down. That's super interesting. I, you, there's there's another best practice, um, best practice I'll put in quotes, but a really interesting deployment around that like, hey, you know, because it's so far in the future, we haven't talked to you in a long time. You may have received care elsewhere, which even like referral scheduling is one of the academic partners we work with in the Pacific Northwest. They did this uh, opportunity on the referral, like their work queue, where it's like, hey, we haven't actually called the patient in six months. So we message them and actually say like, are you still interested in our care? And if you're not, it's totally cool, right? Like we get it. Like you're not going to wait six months for this GI dog. And it became a really powerful thing for them because they're able to actually take a look at the referral of work and see which are the actual referrals that made sense, the ones they wanted to work. What we have used it, sorry, um, just to piggyback off of that, we've used this, um, you know, our primary care panels are kind of out of control and we're back to the whole, like, do we need more providers or do we need smaller panels? And I was like, well, have we, have we reached out to anybody to find out if we're still Ask there? Ask them if they're still considered, you know, Dr. X, your doctor, yeah. And then alternatively, another use case that we used, we had a very long backlog for um, endoscopy. Sure. And we had orders in the depot from five years ago. And everybody kept talking about this backlog. And naturally, when we were being asked to generate additional revenue, oh, the backlog, the backlog. And they're like, well, we can't call every patient. I'm like, no, we're not going to call every patient. We're going to text every patient. And we're going to say, if you're still interested in coming in for your endoscopy appointment, please call us at, and we were able to clear it out in like three weeks, get it all under control and get us back to a manageable level of what our true need was in the endoscopy space. Yeah, because then you can look at the endoscopy backlog as potential revenue, right? As opposed to, as opposed to more staff work, which is really the theme of this, right? And I think there's another interesting use case that uh, you talked a lot about. Let me just see if I can get to this one. Yeah, which was around, you know, providers being out. You know, you have a large provider base. Some doc is going to be out on any given day. Typically, you know, in a, you know, less technologically enabled health system, that would involve like, you know, dialing for smiles, right? But you guys ended up using some of the Luma capabilities here to really scale up your operation here. So I'd love if you can kind of share with the audience a little bit about how you guys manage this workflow so efficiently. Sure. So, I mean, inclement weather is something that we don't deal with much in the winter because it doesn't really snow here, but God forbid, if it does, it is a holy crisis. And, um, you know, we either have to flip everybody to telemedicine appointments or we have to cancel and reschedule. And exactly to Aditya's point, you know, we just had an inclement weather episode. I don't know. I think it was in the beginning of January 
And, you know, we mobilized my access team. We met with each service line and said, what are we doing? Are we flipping a telemedicine? Or are we rescheduling? What does that look like? But we could get these messages out like almost immediately to say, your, you know, your appointment needs to be rescheduled, you know, reschedule this link or call us or, um, you know, we're flipping you to telemedicine, whatever, whatever that version is. Um, and, you know, we, we had a very large uh, tornado here in Little Rock last March. And um, we utilized that, ironically, in a tornado, but there were still people that, you know, had cell service that we could get messages out that, you know, we're not able to see you and, and things of that nature. So we do this um, primarily for incumbent weather. We do this for providers that are leaving, as Aditya had, you know, stated that, you know, your provider is, is leaving UAMS, please contact us at this number to, to, camp or to schedule. One of the things I want to move to is direct scheduling via yes. text. Um, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time, <laughs> um, with our provider group. Um, but we are going to start to pilot it in those areas where we can pull a like for like, um, like we do with rescheduling as well as making sure that it's the appropriate patient in the right time, you know, historically in subspecialized academic medicine, it's, it's really hard to do self-scheduling for, you know, a, a movement. Disorder. For a hyper-specialized, you know, yeah. yeah. There's a lot more to explain it. But the low-hanging fruit areas, you know, in my opinion, primary care, you're sick or well, that's a slam dunk. It's just getting the providers to understand that they're not going to get 72 patients in a one-hour spot. They, you know, it's just a little bit of education on the template is your template. It's no different than if they call somebody to schedule they're just doing it on their phone. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's one of the the things that gets really, um, you know, we were talking earlier about like, there's some amount of changing hearts and minds that has to happen, but there's also some other piece around, like, you kind of have to trust the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, if a scheduler, like a scheduler, when you call in may not have super triple overbook permissions, right? And they're not going to mess it up. Neither does the automations, right? Like the, the automation has very similar, uh, speak in epic terminology, like, ske ske like scheduling permissions, then an agent on the phone would. And so like kind of educating that, you know, there is this, um, this ad additional ability that is like a staff member like capability. I think that helps move the needle a lot. It, it reminds me of this one story. We went live with an academic in uh, the Bronx and uh, one of the doctors in one of the service lines texted the service line, the, the, the uh, VP of transformation. And he texted her, I'm noticing that there's this new user, there's a new staff member named Luma uh, updating my calendar. And it's awesome. They're so on top of things. Just can you give them a, an attaboy or congratulations? And they're like, because like inside of Epic, like the user updated it. When you look at the like appointment desk, it said like updated by Luma. And they're like, wonderful. Like that staff member is doing a great job. So I think there's like, you know, I like to always go back to the theme of why we we, we put this uh, webinar together, which is what can we do as leaders to help, you know, drive access without really ratcheting up staff costs. And I think that becomes like such a, um, such a common pattern where if like we can do more of those sorts of things, it really lets and lets us leverage Swiss army knives across like, you know, how can you take these different technologies and use them in a lot of different cases, which I wanted to throw this visual on because um, I really noticed that, you know, when I was there at UAMS, one of the things that was very uh, notable to me was that there was, uh, you know, the standard kind of use of Luma kind of stuff with rescheduling messaging, but you guys had also found really novel ways to use the technology. So like some of the MyChart activation stuff that you were doing, you know, we were talking about pop health and clinical stuff. So talk to us a little bit, like, where's your mind going in terms of like using communication as a superpower to help engage your patients? You know, it's it's one of those things. I sometimes when I meet with providers just to figure out like what are their challenges with getting their patients back to clinic or what are their challenges with getting wellness visits. I always say, like, if you are gonna talk to the patient, you had 30 seconds, what what would it be? And they pretty much give me the verbiage that I need for what I need to send it. <laughs> so it's it's fairly straightforward. Um, you know, we're we're really um wanting to start kicking off out the um the recall capability so that we can start to recall patients for their wellness visits, um, you know, mammograms, uh, GYN appointments, PSAs, you know, all of those things that, you know, are, are revenue that's sitting there that like, why can't I be proactive, proactive and send a message out and say, Hey, Michelle, you're new for your mammogram. Would you like to schedule now and capture that revenue versus, you know, giving someone an option to start to think about it or where do they need to go? 
Um, and then, you know, provider outages was a big thing for us that we we've, we've worked through a lot with this. Um, you know, I come up with crazy ways of how can we utilize Luma to help us with our, you know, our patient transfer, you know, center. They roll up under me and how nice would it be for a provider in an outside facility just to be able to text something over about what they need and all the legwork is done. And so my brain is in a, is in a hundred different um, ways, but I, you know, for us, Luma has really been an easy way for us to eliminate a lot of this low hanging fruit that requires yeah. a lot of staff time, human capital to do. And I've been really successful in, you know, coming here and not asking for any new FTE in the three years that I've been here because I've, you know, utilized technology in other ways kind of to make, to make it work. That is, that is a one liner if I've ever heard of one in three years, I've not requested any FTEs. Like talk about returning economics to the health system. Right. And one of the really interesting ways that we were talking kind of in the past around how do you kind of keep that trend going is around, you know, digital call deflection. One of the um, kind of prep pieces I had, and I skipped over just because I think the conversation was going in an interesting spot was, uh, Michelle, you'd shared with me a stat around your after hours cancellations, like how much of voicemail does your team work its way through? So one of the things we were thinking about, and I'd love to hear the story was using things like digital call deflection. It's like automations on, you know, not just the outbound text messaging, but inbound phone calls. So I'd love if you can kind of share with the audience. And I think after that, we'll go to Q and A around like kind of where some of the future of this, uh, you know, I've hired zero FTEs, like where can it go? And like, how can you scale it up? We, um, we have an archaic process, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but it works. And it's just one of those things that we haven't really had an opportunity to get to yet. Um, and digital call deflection is going to be the thing that solutions this for us. Um, we are the call-in center for any patient that needs to cancel their appointment. So during daytime hours, when we're available, we answer the call, but after hours and weekends, it rolls to a voicemail. And that is somebody's job every morning to come in and listen to all the voicemails and go in and cancel the patients that have called in either the night before or the weekend before, or, you know, or over the weekend. Um, I, and I'll be honest, human error, you miss somebody, it's a no-show. I mean, so it's, it's, it's a nightmare of a process and um, it, we just can't dedicate people's time to it anymore, but it's a very important functionality that we need to do. So um, partnering with Luma, looking at digital call deflection, you know, there's things, I'm going to say it wrong, but this is the way I explain it. You bolt it on top of your IVR. It gives your patient options. And if they say they want to reschedule, they can push the button to reschedule. A text message will get sent to the patient and they'll be able to reschedule their appointment, therefore eliminating the need for me to have somebody sitting and looking at a voice, you know, listening. It's horrific to even think about that we are doing it. Um, <laughs> But, you know, and it's one of the ways, I mean, there's a multitude of other things that we can do with digital call deflection. But for me, that's going to be a huge win because I either need to dedicate more FTE to get this voicemail thing done faster, or we just don't take the race, you know, or we just don't listen to the messages and then that the downfall of that is no shows. So um, we're really looking forward to getting this implemented. And, and see you know, one of the things that I, I would, I would imagine a lot of folks would say, well, the patient should just do it on my chart, right? Like, and the answer is like, yes, many do, but there are going to be many who don't, right? I hear all the time when I, I now in my new role of cancer, I'm, I'm in the cancer clinics a lot. And I will hear the nurses saying, you know, you can get your after, after visit summary in your MyChart account. I don't know my login. I lost my login. I can't find my login. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, it's not, I think everybody thinks everybody uses my chart to the full ex extent that it can be used, but I don't really think patients do. Um, and specifically, you know, generational. If I asked my dad to go check his my chart account, he would have no idea how to do it. So, it, you know, it's just one of those things. That, but he knows how to do a text message, right? So, oh, totally. We can get to patients um, any way we need them. And I guess the other thing I would say that was really helpful for us from, from a Luma perspective was they took it to heart when I said like, we need to do a text message, a voicemail and an email. I needed a three pronged approach for these, for these patients. And, and that's what we do. You know, whatever their preference is in Epic, we start with that. And then, you know, if we get no response, then we'll go to an, a, a voicemail or an email or, or whatever the case may be. Well, and I also think like, you know, my chart's phenomenal. It's rich in capabilities, easy to use, but you know, patients, it's like, it's like saying like, I, mean, I think the airline analogy works actually quite well here. It's like, you're going to call the airline sometimes, right? Like it's just going to happen. And so having great tools in that 
like omni-channel experience, really, if we're thinking about it from consumer access, like an omni-channel, true omni-channel approach, like it has to be um, at the system level. And I think you hit on this really well earlier, which was, you know, when you think about access, it's a system level approach. You can't just have like the call center team doing this and then the physician groups doing this. Like there's no difference when you think about the digital touch points actually being truly omni-channel because you know, you're going to have people calling in, you're going to have a text-based approach, you're going to have a web-based approach or an app-based approach with my chart. So you kind of have to put all these pieces together to have like one voice in one set of entry points that leads to a common set of outcomes for your patients. You know, and, and when you talk about the system level and you talk about an access center, and this is one of the things people always say to me, oh my God, don't you get so sick and tired of hearing like, oh, it's the access center's fault. They did it wrong. They did it this. They did it that. I will gladly grow the access center to take on more people and, um, you know, like transition people from clinics over because I'm a bit of a control freak, but I can control that because anybody that's actually ever been in a call center or worked in a call center hears all the time, your people did this wrong. And then you go and investigate it and it's someone in the clinic. <laughs> so when we, when we look at it from a system level perspective, you know, the more kind of market share I can get on that, the easier it is from, you know, for the patient experience and trying to troubleshoot problems. Because if if it's not something that my team did or didn't do, then it's someone in the clinic who we have to retrain or, or teach differently, but I'm not the one overseeing that somebody else is. So I always look at this from a system level to make sure that at the top, we have the right resources, the right things in place in order to be successful. So we get out of this, you know, back and forth about who did what and when, and everybody knows who to go to versus, yeah. it, you know, let me call this person, let me talk to that person. It, you know, it ultimately that provides a better consumer experience, right? Because okay. again, I know I, you know, said, you know, 30, 40 minutes ago, like airlines are a horrible analogy in parallel to healthcare, but there's a couple of things, I think lessons there, which is you don't call the, you know, Chicago O'Hare United Airlines number, right? Say like, I can't book and check into the, the O'Hare destination flight. And, right. you know, you call the entity you have a relationship with, you have a relationship with UAMS and you want that because you want to be able to deliver a long-term value to the patient. You want to have a long lasting relationship for them and their families too, right? So- right. It's I, I think that that thought around, you know, centralizing, you know, one place, you know, like you said, I, I think you said bit of control freak. I think you actually I would reframe that into you have a very high bar for quality. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, you want to produce a good experience. And I think that's admirable. And so I think we'll move. I think I saw a couple cute questions land in the Q&A. But first and foremost, I mean. Michelle, your experience and kind of the work you've done at UAMS, I think it serves as a, like a, a shining example of what can be done when access is really put at the center of how a patient navigates a large and complex health system. So I want to thank you for sharing kind of your insights and your wisdom. I think they're invaluable to me to hear, but also I think hopefully for the Chime community as well. Yes. And I mean, it's, it's going to sound corny, but thank you guys for being our partner because without it, I mean, you know, I have this vision and I'm like, what do I do and how do I operationalize it? <laughs> And, you know, quite honestly, like I can go to my CMO and say, you know, or CMIO and say, hey, can we do this in Epic? Yeah, but, you know, we're going to have to put you on the priority list and you're probably like number 752,000. So it's kind of like I've got this that I need to get done quickly. And this is the yes, speed to impact. Supplement, yes. Yeah, love it. I appreciate you every day. Uh, Aaron, would love to open up for questions. I think you're going to be the MC on the Q&A. Yep, we've got several questions that came through. If you want to ask a question, go ahead and type it into the Q&A chat. And even if we don't get to your question today, I will make sure to forward the questions on to the team and they can do um, outreach post uh, session as well. So the first question I got that came through is, can you point to us, can you point to us the collateral on Elizabeth Wilcox? You mentioned you follow a lot of her standards. So Elizabeth Woodcock uh, created the Patient Access Collaborative, which is a, a cohort of academic medical centers across the country. Um, if you Google Patient Access Collaborative, you will get a ton of information there. Um, and if you Google Elizabeth Woodcock uh, Access uh, Metrics, her the PDF will pop up. I can send it out to the group, but if you just need it. Immediately. Especially if you in the world of academic medicine, I think her work and you know what she does in PAC is really, really invaluable. They do great work. We just did a whole set of access best practices that were was published as well, which was great. 
And I will note, it looks like Alex popped a um, link in the chat. So if any of the attendees see the link in there, Alex popped that in there from the Luma Health team. Um, so the next question I have is, one of the struggles we have as a specialty practice is that our physicians have pretty complex preferences and the cheat sheet for our schedulers is a page long. How do you deal with that? Yeah, um, I, it's everywhere you go. Um, I dealt with this in consultancy everywhere. Um, you know, we utilize, we're an epic shop. We deal, we utilize uh, decision trees. And what I really will do is when we start to get into design around scheduling or we um, bring a new provider on board, we, I sit down personally with them with um, a few of my schedulers and we talk about what is it you're trying to achieve? What would you like to get out of this? Talk to me about your preferences. And then we really sit down and think about ways that, in which Epic can work for us and how we can use the information that's already in the system. And then um, sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a touch and go conversation about like, what do you really need this for? And I can give you a great example. I was doing some consultancy and a GI provider was specific about this one particular lab value that he wanted the parents to reference when they were scheduling an appointment. And I said, what do you do with that? Do you do anything with it? Do you look at it? Do you see the scheduling stuff? Like, are you, and then he's like, no, I, I have no idea why I asked the question. I'm like, excellent. Let's just get rid of it. So it's just really sitting down and understanding why they're asking what they're asking or what their preferences are. And then thinking of ways that you can um, overcome those. I like that the answer was there's, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's It was priceless. Credit for the honesty, honestly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next question here, um, they might all kind of go together because it's from one person, but I'll start with the first one that they've asked. Um, when you talk about metrics that tell you something is working or not working, what were the metrics that did what you wanted to know based on the outcome? <laughs> So my biggest compass of whether something is working or not working to start, like the canary in the coal mine, is the provider. <laughs> so if providers are starting to complain or providers are saying something is different and I don't like it is one thing. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about from an ENT perspective was, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we decreased the notion of same day cancel rate. So that was my metric. We implemented rescheduling. Did we make an impact? The other thing, um, just, you know, like, because I'm a huge Luma fan, but to give a plug, they have so much data around the text messages and things that they send out. So I can tell you exactly what percentage of individuals rescheduled. I can tell you exactly what percentages of individuals looked at their text, didn't look at their text, how many people we had to call, how many people we had to use um, from a, you know, a, get to from a voicemail perspective. So I sit down and kind of just frame out like, what is the problem? What are we trying to achieve? And then what metrics do I work behind that? And then I naturally listen to everybody. I talk to the nurses in the clinic. I talk to our schedulers. I talk to the providers. And we kind of get a feel that way, whether or not it's working. But I do like to attribute one or two really hard metrics that, you know, are finance numbers based that we can prove. I hope that answered that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have is, as you designed the process, what worked best to you do before you discovered that? So what worked best? It was just lots of communication, right? I mean, nobody, as soon as I got here, everybody thought, oh my God, they're just gonna make me do more, she's gonna make me work more, and that wasn't it. The best way I approach a lot of this is through communication. What do you want to achieve in your clinic? How do you want this to look on the provider side? And then I kind of work backwards from there. You know, I knew when I came here, I wasn't walking into a organization that was making trillions of dollars. So I had to start to think about, you know, low hanging fruit. What's the best thing that we can attack? What's going to give me some quick wins? What's going to give the organization some quick wins to show like, A, I knew what I was doing <laughs> and B, just that like we can fix this. Um, and that's kind of how I, I structured everything. It was, it was a lot of talking. It was a lot of listening. And then again, you know, like I said earlier, physicians don't understand appointment scheduling. They don't understand what we're doing in it. So it's a lot of communication. Great. Thank you. And I know we're at time, but we only have one question, so I'm going to yeah. go ahead and ask it. Um, 
Do you know what percentage of your patients use my chart effectively? And how did you determine that? So this is a, it's the age old, age old question, right? I hear that we have, I, I'm told and I've seen data around, we have 70% of our patients are, are on Epic or on, are you, are, are on my chart. And I'm kind of jaded by this because I don't know about all your organizations, but when, when I went through COVID at Wellstar, as well as here at UMS, anybody that needed their COVID screening got a my chart okay, to get their lab result. So I think some of that is falsely inflated. And right now, we're working on a project in and around Luma to determine how much my chart usage there actually is. And we want to start out first with just a simple question of, are, do you use my chart? Do you find those kinds of things? So, so that that's we, like a subjective set of questions mm -hmm. rather than the quantitative data you can run out right. of like report. Yeah. Um, and then kind of work our way back. I don't know, and I'm not the CMIO obviously, but I don't know if there's like a specific hard wired way to determine usage. I'm sure there is. But to me, if someone goes in once, that's not obviously an act, you know, they're not really interacting with, with my chart. So um, we're trying to understand that a little bit better. I think some of the systems I'm starting to hear a lot more about is exactly what you're saying is like actually just surveying the patient. Like, did you, did you use my chart? Did you like it? Did you like, it's the kind of like very basic sort of stuff, but like stuff we need as like health systems. And one of the other ones, uh, maybe to actually, had some layers on, we, we talk a lot about Lumen, our patient facing kind of things about weekly active users, monthly active users, weekly active divided by monthly active, like, you know, so you can use kind of web consumer engagement models, not just like, you know, straight up reports that saying I have 70,000 WPR records in Epic or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys for everything. Um, thanks for listening to me talk an hour about one of my most favorite, um, aspects of life and patient access. I appreciate it. Um, I believe Aaron has my contact details. So if there's anything you want to send my way or want to talk about um, anytime, feel free, call, text, chat, whatever it is. Um, I'm happy to talk more about patient access. <laughs> and thank you, Aaron, for being such a wonderful host. We appreciate all of you joining us today. Sure, no worries. I am going to take this opportunity to thank everyone who attended live. Also, too, don't forget there is a survey that'll pop up in your web browser. Please feel free to give us um, your feedback. And then also, too, if you need to flag yourself to have additional discussion with Michelle and Luma Health, we will uh, make sure to get that information on to them. So again, thank you, Michelle and Adita. We appreciate you um, today hosting this session for our provider members. And I hope everyone just has a really great afternoon. Afternoon. Thank you. See you Take all. care. Bye.